name is Jonathan Wilson, and I'm an attorney at the uh, Atlanta law firm of Taylor English Duma. And what Sydney asked me to do today was a slightly different look at Regulation A+. You know, a lot of the folks in this room are professionals. Uh, you, you're familiar with the securities industry. You go a lot deeper into the weeds than a lot of the folks who are issuers <laughs> in the Regulation A-plus space. My focus as a corporate generalist and as a, a part-time securities lawyer and as a part-time software lawyer and a part-time HR lawyer is dealing with the actual operators, the people who have founded these companies, built these companies up. Uh, they come to me for all the sorts of issues that uh, an operating company has every day, everything from negotiating contracts, fighting litigation, hiring and firing employees. And when it comes time to raise capital, I need to be able to translate to them exactly what is involved, the, uh, the who, the what, the where, the entire process of bringing an offering to market. And it's a very different uh, approach. So what my presentation today is not a recitation of the rules. It's not a bunch of how-to tips. Uh, it's not a bunch of warnings. It's more a set of expectations about how you go through the process of bringing a, a Reg A plus offering to market, who is involved, and how long it takes. Like most entrepreneurs, they want everything right away. They want it now. I, I don't know how many times I've taken the meeting from a client who says, I'm ready to go. I've got all my documents lined up. Can we get this done by the end of the month? And the answer is no, we definitely can't get it done by the end of the month. Well, Jonathan, how fast can you get it done? And I say, well, the fastest that it is going to be possible is probably in the range of 120 to 150 days. That's extremely fast. That's extremely optimistic. I can almost guarantee you, Mr. Client, it won't get done that fast. But I'm going to at least be able to come up with a timeline that shows in one feasible uh, imagination of the universe it might happen that fast. But in order to get anything done, you really need to, to understand who's involved, what are they doing, and when are they doing it. So over this 120 to 150 day time period, probably longer in real life, uh, you need to go through at least three different phases in bringing your offering about. Often clients say, well, okay, that's great. I understand I have to get all this work done, but can't I just get started on it now and maybe save the legal stuff for later? Like maybe I can get my marketing campaign underway now and start testing the waters, but when we get a little bit closer and I know that I have investors involved, then I'll get you, Jonathan, involved and I'll introduce you to my accountant and we can pull together our financial forecast and we can write all these legal documents that you're telling me about. My advice to clients is no, you really can't do that. You need to take an inventory of what you have and know what your story is going to be and have socialized that story with all of your professionals before you get started. You really have to know what it is you're going to need with you by the time you get to the end of the process before you even start on that process or you're really going to be in for some disappointment. And, uh, I love Joan's story about the, uh, the investor who thought they went public and all they really had was a, was a QCIP number. Uh, I thought of this the other day. My, my uh, 12 year old son, very bright guy, we're lucky enough though to live in a place where he can actually walk to school. He w walks to middle school and on, on bright sunny days he rides his bike. And so the other day he took off on his bike, he had his trumpet strapped on the back, he had his backpack, had a great day. The way he always does is he texts my wife as he's leaving school, mom on my way home, she says great, love you. She goes out on the front step to watch him come home and here he is walking down the road. She texts him, where's your bike? This is the look on his face, the, the crestfallen look, oh gosh, he left his bike back at school, he has to go back and get it. Well, if you are an issuer getting ready to go have a public offering of your securities, you want to make sure that you're going to have your bike by the time you're done. You don't want to forget something. And that's why you need to go through the process of getting it all done early on. You want to have your financials pulled together. You want to have a financial forecast. You want to have a go-to-market plan. You need to get your legal, accounting, marketing, and investor relations all in sync, all working together on day one before you get started with anything else. Whether you're going to test the waters or not, that phase comes after you've already gotten all those folks together. They've thought through what your story is going to be. You've done the legal due diligence to know that the documents are there to back up what you're going to say. And your financial statements are also going to support what you're going to be telling investors in your offering documents. If you do it that way, by the time you get to closing and you're actually collecting those uh, subscription agreements, you're issuing shares, you're collecting payment, all the hard work has been done because you did it all on the front end. So we talked about the when, this is the who. <coughs> the players that you need to have for your offering. 
Well, the founders and key managers of the company need to be involved. I've had some clients who say, well, you know, I'm, I'm the founder of the company. Uh, I know our books and records. I don't need to get my head of sales involved. I want him out selling. I don't want to get my head of marketing involved. He's out marketing. I, I strongly encourage clients to get all of those C-suite people involved because when you go to investors in an offering, you are saying an awful lot about your company. And if what you're saying to investors is what you're different than what you're saying to your customers, you could really find some, some painful dissonance in the market. So have all of those C-suite investors and uh, C-suite players involved. You need to have your, your law firm involved early on. This is, as you know, a highly legal process. And if you don't have legal involved early on, you could quickly find yourself having a foot fault before you've even gotten started. And you need to have your accounting firm involved. You need to have your marketing firm, probably a placement agent, your, the portal through which you're going to be selling these shares, and whoever it is that's managing investor relations. In some cases, that's going to bleed over into marketing. But all those folks need to be talking to each other. They need to be developing a story that uh, hangs together, and they need to be doing all of that in cooperation and in harmony. Because ultimately, it's about legal, finance, and investor relations in a, in a continuous loop. You do the due diligence at the beginning end to make sure that we know what we are saying, we know how we are saying it, and we're saying it in the right documents in the right way. If we're saying that we're a software company and this is our proprietary software, well, have you looked at all of the contracts you had with all of your founders? Have they, in fact, assigned all of their intellectual property rights to the company the way they ought to? If you are a real estate company and you say that you uh, own 100 acres of real estate and you're, you've got this great multi-use uh, uh, project going on, do you, in fact, have legal title to the property? Or are you already leveraged with a senior lender who has a lien on the property? And, uh, and if, if so, are you in compliance with all of your loan covenants? Because if you don't know those facts, when you go out to investor relations and you're actually trying to sell your securities to the market, you could very well be tripping up yourself by saying something that is not entirely accurate. So at the very, at the very beginning stages, legal, finance, and investor relations all need to be in harmony with each other. They all need to be talking to each other. The founder is all about uh, vision. The, the entrepreneur wants to tell the market, this is where I see us going. Sure, we're a $10 million software company now, but we're going to be the next big thing. We're going to be a $100 billion company any day. I just know it, and this is the vision that I can see. But the legal department, the lawyer, wants to warn the market about the risks with precision. The lawyer wants to say, well, you might want to be that, but really all you have is this. Really, your contracts only do this. The challenge is to balance the precision with the vision. So. As a lawyer who advises clients that do securities offerings, I always want to start off with my diligence file. This is now way down in the weeds. We want to get the corporate documents right, make sure that we have built out a cap table so we, we know who the current shareholders are now, and we actually want to get copies of all of the documents of every single investor in the company to know that all of those shares have been duly and validly issued. Otherwise, we're going to have a footfall coming right out of the door. I want to see the employment agreements of all of the executives of the company. I want to make sure that they are entitled to work in the United States. I want to make sure that they have assigned their intellectual property rights to the company, that they have a binding confidentiality obligation, and if appropriate, they have other restrictive covenants like non-competition and non-solicitation of customers. I want to look at the material contracts. I want to actually see the contracts with the signature. Don't show me the last draft that you shook hands over. I want to see the actual contract with signatures on it. And then I want you to tell me, Mr. Client, that there aren't any amendments to that contract so that we know that we have the complete story. The reason why, because somewhere I'm going to be writing MD&A inside of that Form 1A that talks about the company. And if you tell me that you have a partnership with Acme Corporation to go sell your product, I want to see the partnership agreement with Acme Corporation that says how they're going to sell your product. And if you're telling me that you're guaranteed to get a 15% margin on every one of those sales, I want to see the contract that tells me how you're getting a 15% margin on every one of those sales. And if you haven't done that work at the front end, well, then you don't know when you go out to test the market whether you're actually saying the right thing that you're going to be able to say when your legal documents are finally done. If you've done all that, you've got a financial forecast, you've got a cap table, you've got the material contracts, now you're ready to develop the risk factors for the company. All right, we're a, we're a software company. <coughs> we sell a product that does X and Y and Z. These are our revenues. This is our forecast. What could go wrong? Well, 90% of that, maybe 80% 80, 80 of that, is the same for every company. We could run out of money. The market might not like our product as much as we think they will. 
Uh, taste could change. People might, might not use our products. But there's another 20% that is highly specialized and very important to get right. If you understand all the material contracts in the company, you understand where it came from and what its forecast is, and what are the contingencies that are going to make that forecast come true, then you're able to craft risk factors that are going to find their way into Form 1A when you get ready to file. The importance of doing all this at the front end is so that when you do start testing the waters, you're getting it right. This is a deeper dive into financial forecasting. At the same time that the lawyer is doing all of that, with the due diligence file and reading all the material contracts, marketing, distribution of the securities, the investor relations function needs to be making sure that all of that story is consistent. You need to have an investor relations campaign to drive indications of interest. Who are the natural investors in this company? Your renewable energy company, you're, you have some new technology that's going to drive power in some new green way. Well, have you reached out to all of the natural affinity groups in the United States who might want to be investors in this, who might have an emotional attachment to what you're trying to do? Can you get the marketing list for some of those organizations and perhaps call on them as potential investors? Um, do you have a marketing in, uh, firm that, uh, uh, that is able to take on the investor relations function to build up uh, uh, a group of loyal followers who are going to have an interest in your company and who are going to drive the crowd to the portal to pick up the securities? You need to develop that messaging plan and the collateral as part of the Testing the Waters campaign. And hopefully, if you've done your job right, it's consistent with what you're going to be saying in your Form 1A. If you've done all that, by the time you get to Testing the Waters, uh, you're, you've got things organized. You're able to use social media and outbound calling to collect indications of interest, and you're able to report on progress as you go. Uh, if you've done this right for a lot of consumer-based uh, products, you're actually developing a fan base of prospective investors. The same people who have an interest in your company, who might even be customers of your company, would have an interest in being investors in your company as well. Form 1A gets drafted while testing the waters is underway or after you've done that initial phase one of due diligence. And the drafting and disclosures should be done in coordination with the due diligence, with comments from the stakeholders and advisors, and with input from the investor relations function. That is the continuous loop that we talked about earlier to make sure that the story that we're saying in our social media campaign is consistent with what we're saying in our legal documents. Oops. I think I pressed the wrong button. Am I able to get back? Sorry about that. Uh, it's, it's near the end. We're, we're very near the end. Okay. Okay, we go. Can we go the other direction? Great. Close enough. Okay. Sure. So phase three, you've filed your 1A, you've taken your comments from the SEC. Hopefully they've been as efficient in dealing with my client as, as they were with Steve. I sure hope so. Uh, it's not often that you get a, uh, a love letter to the government about how efficient they were, uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that experience myself. Uh, the SEC declares your prospectus effective. You're able to solicit <coughs> subscription agreements and payment and actually conduct a closing. Uh, if you are going to be listing your shares on OTC, there's groundwork that you've done before this time, but that takes place after your, after your closing occurs. Uh, your OTC listing, I won't walk you through all the steps here, but there are some very important mechanical uh, steps to go through, and like I said with the, uh, the story of my son with his, with his bike not coming home from school, you need to think it through at the front end or else you're going to be very disappointed on the back end when you get there. So the story that I hope that I've been able to tell, uh, my law firm is, a, is 125 lawyers in Atlanta. We're a full-service law firm, and our clients are operating entities. So the story that we try to tell to operators is one that is optimism, but it's tinged with some realism as well. And that is that you can accomplish a lot with Regulation A. It could be a very effective tool to raise money and to provide liquidity uh, through an OTC listing, but it's not going to happen this month. It's not going to happen next month. You need to think of this as a process. And as, as, a, as part of playing out that process, you need to bring your whole team together early at the early stages of the process, think it through, 
You make sure that you have a consistent message that you can tell all the way through the process from beginning and end. And if you're committed to that entire process all the way through, you can make that work for you. Yes, sir. Uh, I think that you, uh, if, if you're doing a confidential filing, I think that you can, but not until, it, not, not after it goes effective. You're, you're testing the waters is, is over at that point. Well, no, not effective, but I mean, yeah, you can test the water before, before filing. Yes, yes you can. I believe that you can, yes. And Mark agrees. <laughs> yes. Sure. Well, I would distinguish between the people who have filed Form 1A versus the companies who are truly viable to be to, to engage in an offering and take it all the way through the ending. I, I think someone told me there have been about 100 Form 1As filed. I think fewer than half of those are ever going to come out. And probably even smaller number of those are actually going to be successfully funded all the way through. The ones who will be successful are the ones who have thought it all the way through, who have invested the resources at the front end to bring legal marketing and accounting together, and who have a viable product. You know, I, I think that a company that has an idea and a platform and a, an attitude of if we build it, they will come, that's not a very good candidate for Regulation 1A. I think that Regulation, excuse me, Regulation A is an effective tool uh, for the type of company that 25 years ago would have been an IPO on the NASDAQ. They've got 20, 30, 40 million dollars in revenue. They've got a little bit of profitability. They need growth capital to take it to the next step. 20 years ago, that, that entity was a, was a candidate for an underwritten IPO. Today, that's impossible because it's so expensive, largely because of Sarbanes-Oxley and, and, and developments like that. But Reg A with OTC liquidity on the back end can take the place of that traditional underwritten IPO and can do so actually in a way that's a lot less expensive than an IPO was even 20 years ago. I can answer the second question better than I can answer the first question. There have only been a handful, and you know, Elio Motors is the one that everyone talks about. I actually think Elio is a little bit of an outlier because it's an unusual product that is largely untested. You know, how many Elio vehicles have you seen driving by you on the highway? Probably not very, not very many. The clients of mine that are looking at it are software companies that have 10 and 20 million dollars worth of sales and think that they could increase that by a factor of 10 if they could hire 20 more salespeople. Uh, a mixed-use uh, real estate development uh, that has grown and it's profitable as it is today, but with an additional 20 million, they could add the, the capacity to triple their revenues. That's a great prospect. Uh, a company that's already producing a product and doing so profitably, but with another 20 million dollars, they can increase capacity. They can not only make more, but they can get more economies of scale. Those, I think, are the best candidates for Reg A offerings. How far can is mixed real estate and another one that is uh, manufacturing? Manufacturing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. Jonathan Rice for Cloud Find and his video is going to be available. Again, if you have any questions, thank you very much. Thank you.